There have been tons of incredible performances throughout the history of the NFL that came in a losing effort. If their team lost the game, there was no way whatsoever that you could blame this player for the loss, because he gave it his all, and then some. Bills running back OJ Simpson running for 273 yards and two touchdowns on Thanksgiving against the Detroit Lions. Jaguars wide receiver Jimmy Smith against the vaunted 2000 Ravens defense, recording 15 receptions for 291 yards and three touchdowns. Patriots quarterback Tom Brady throwing for over 500 yards with three touchdowns and no picks at Super Bowl 52. The list goes on and on. But there's one of these performances that seems to have been forgotten throughout NFL history that, considering the circumstances, might be the most remarkable performance of them all. This is Pittsburgh Steelers fullback John Fuqua. Entering the 1970 regular season finale against the Philadelphia Eagles, he was badly injured, to the point where the team doctors were even telling him not to play in the game. And yet, not only did he play, but he put up a performance for the ages, and a performance that, for more than 30 years, set a franchise record. This is the story behind John Fuqua at the most remarkable performance ever in a losing effort. Before I talk about the performance in question, we need some context to understand who John Fuqua is, how he was playing before this game, and the severity of the injury that made this performance all the more remarkable. Our story begins in 1969, when the New York Giants drafted the Morgan State fullback with their 11th round pick. However, after barely playing that season, touching the ball just 23 times, the Giants traded him to the Steelers in 1970, along with linebacker and defensive end Henry Davis, for quarterback Dick Shiner. Yes, that's his real name. I did a video about his time with the Giants, so if you want to learn more about that, then click the card in the upper right corner. Anyways, Fuqua was now hoping to continue his pro football career in a new location, and one where he actually become a regular in the starting lineup. Through the first 13 weeks of the 1970 season, Fuqua started every game for the Steelers. For the first half of the season, Fuqua didn't get a whole lot of touches, only carrying the ball 39 times for 135 yards, averaging about 3.4 yards per carry. In one game against the Houston Oilers, he had one rushing yard on four carries, and in another game against the Cincinnati Bengals, in one of the more bizarre stat lines of the year, he finished the game with three rushes for negative 17 yards. However, by the second half of the season, he was regularly touching the ball, and was doing a good job producing. He scored his first ever touchdown in a 21-17 victory against the New York Jets in Week 8. In fact, he not only scored the first rushing touchdown of his career, but he scored the first receiving touchdown as well. The Steelers won that game 21-17, with Fuqua scoring two of the team's three touchdowns. From that moment on, Fuqua was a bowling ball who was tough for opposing defenses to stop. Once that first score was out of the way, it was game over for most rushing defenses. From weeks 8-13, through 13, Fuqua found the end zone seven times in six games. He had over 100 yards receiving in a 28-9 victory over the Cleveland Browns. In a game against the Cincinnati Bengals, a team with a top-10 rush defense that season, he had 119 yards rushing on seven yards per carry. After a pedestrian first half, Fuqua was lights out in the second half. But it didn't look like he was going to be able to close out the year the way he wanted to. The good news for Fuqua was that over the second half of the season, there were few players in the league who were tougher to stop than he was. And that's not an exaggeration in the slightest bit. From weeks 8 through 13, no player scored more touchdowns than Fuqua. The bad news was that, well, the rest of the team wasn't very good. It seemed like Pittsburgh wasn't going to be terrible that year, as following an 0-3 start, the Steelers won four of their next five to get to 4-4. They were tied for the division lead in the AFC Central alongside the Cleveland Browns. Their point differential was in the top half of the conference, and it seemed like they had a shot at making the postseason for the second time in franchise history, and the first time since 1947. That did not happen. Pittsburgh completely collapsed down the stretch, and right when Fuqua was starting to heat up, the Steelers were starting to cool down. After beating the Jets in that two-touchdown game by Fuqua, the Steelers lost four of their next five games, thanks to an anemic passing offense where neither Terry Bradshaw nor Terry Henratty, in Chuck Knoll's confusing quarterback rotation system, could get anything going. From a 4-4 four four start, they were now entering the final week of the season with a poor record of 5-8, guaranteed to finish below 500 for the seventh straight season, and guaranteed to once again miss out on a spot in the postseason. All the Steelers had to play for at this point was pride. The last game on the schedule to close out the 1970 campaign would take the Steelers to Franklin Field in Philadelphia as they took on the Eagles. I guess this game had some significance off the field. This game was going to be the final game ever that the Eagles played at Franklin Field before moving into the brand new Veterans Stadium in 1971. And of course, you had the in-state rivalry aspect of it, as this was the battle for the Keystone State, and the first since the Steelers switched conferences. But in terms of the significance on the field and in the standings, this one meant absolutely nothing. Neither team could make the postseason. The game was completely meaningless in that department. Which is what makes what John Fuqua was about to do all the more remarkable. In the week leading up to the game, Fuqua was dealing with some pretty nasty back spasms. When the team doctors realized this, they strongly advised Fuqua to not play in the season finale. For one, the risk just wasn't worth it. 
If Uqua sits out this completely meaningless game, then he's going to be healthy for sure when 1971 rolls around and the team actually needs him again. But if Uqua plays and gets hurt and aggravates the injury even more, then that could be disastrous for his career. When you combine all those factors with what Chuck Knowles said before the game, which is that he wanted to use this game as an opportunity to play some new people and some people he hadn't played as much before, all signs pointed heavily toward Fuqua sitting out the season finale. Fuqua would have ended his first year in Pittsburgh with 7 touchdowns, over 700 yards from scrimmage, and over 4 yards per carry. For an 11th round pick who couldn't find his footing until the second half of the season, those were some great numbers. However, Fuqua insisted on playing this game. He didn't care that the game was meaningless. I didn't care that he was hurt. He was going to do whatever it took to play in the game. Even after everyone advised him not to do it, he did. He made it a point during the pregame warmups to keep moving no matter what, because he couldn't stiffen up. He was wrapped up and had a ton of hot stuff on his back. Whatever he had to do to play in this game, he was going to do. When the game started, Fuqua was out there in the starting lineup for the 14th time in 14 games, ready to go and test out that back of his. Want to see what he did on the very first play from scrimmage? That's right. He took it 72 yards to the house for the score. After one play, Pittsburgh had jumped out to a 7-0 lead, and it came on the longest run of his career. Keep in mind that since entering the NFL in 1969, Fuqua only crossed 72 rushing yards in a game once, and here he was, back spasms and all, surpassing that total on the very first play of the game. The coaching staff had its answer as to whether or not Fuqua could go out there. He absolutely could. When Fuqua went to the sidelines afterwards, trainer Ralph Berlin jokingly said, I'm a great trainer, aren't I? The two men laughed, but Fuqua had no time to stand around because he couldn't let that back of his stiffen up, because his day was just about to get started. Fuqua had that incredibly impressive 72-yard touchdown in the first quarter, but you want to know what's more impressive than a 72-yard touchdown? How about an 85-yard touchdown? Because that's exactly what he did in the second quarter. That was the longest run by any player in the NFL during the 1970 season, and it came from a fullback who had a bad back and had no business even playing in that game. Fuqua would later say that one of the reasons he felt good enough to go was because the temperature was great, as it was 70 degrees outside. However, I don't know where he got that, because the actual temperature was 44 degrees. I don't know the last time a late December day in Philly was in the 70s. Regardless, Fuqua was a force to be reckoned with on this day. By the time the game ended, Fuqua finished with 218 rushing yards and over 10 yards per carry. Combine that with the 38 receiving yards he had, and Fuqua finished the game with 256 yards from scrimmage. Pittsburgh finished that game with 341 yards, meaning that Fuqua had over 75% of the team's total yardage on that day. He also finished the game with the most rushing yards in a single game in Steelers history, which is a record that would stand all the way until 2006, when Willie Parker had 223 yards in a 27-7 victory over the Cleveland Browns. With all the great runners in Steelers history, including Hall of Famers like Franco Harris and John Henry Johnson, the man who held that single game record was a fullback with back spasms. And for some more perspective, here's a look at every single team that played in Week 14 of the 1970 season, excluding the Steelers for obvious reasons. As a side note, I did a video on Week 14 and how that might have been, from an on-the-field competitive standpoint, the worst week in NFL history. So if you want to learn more about that, then click the card in the upper right corner. This graph represents the total yardage that each team got that week. The goal bar in the middle? That's John Fuqua's yardage. By himself, he had more yards than 11 teams in the league. He had more yardage than the Atlanta Falcons and Green Bay Packers had combined. When one man has more yards than an entire team, that's always impressive. When one man has more yards than roughly half of the league, holy cow, that's incredible. And the most incredible part about all of this? Pittsburgh somehow lost the game. Unfortunately for Fuqua, his efforts came in a meaningless game in a losing performance. After the Steelers jumped out to a 14-13 lead on those two touchdown runs, Pittsburgh would never find the end zone for the remainder of the game and would wind up losing it 30-20. It didn't help that the Steelers committed 8 penalties for 72 yards, turned it over 2 times, and had a mere 82 net passing yards while Terry Henratty completed less than 50% of his passes, while allowing Norm Snead on the other side to complete over 72% of his passes and throw for 276 yards. However, if Uqua was upset about not winning games, he would get his wish soon, because he was about to be a part of the great Steelers dynasty of the 1970s. He was controversially involved in the Immaculate Reception, where people to this day debate as to whether or not Fuqua actually touched the ball. Besides that, though, he had an incredibly productive career on his way to winning two Super Bowl titles. He was Pittsburgh's starting fullback throughout the early part of the 1970s, and finished his career with over 3,000 rushing yards, well over 4,000 yards from scrimmage, and 24 touchdowns. Today, despite not making any Pro Bowls or receiving any accolades outside of 1970, where he led the league in yards per touch and finished second in yards per carry, he is remembered as a Steelers legend. It's been more than 50 years since John Fuqua's iconic performance against the Eagles, and considering the circumstances, 
it truly might be the greatest performance by a player ever in a losing effort. When you consider the fact that he was dealing with back spasms, the fact that the team doctors advised him not to play in the game, the fact that the game was completely meaningless and he was risking a whole lot by suiting up, and the fact that he not only put up career best numbers, but numbers that were better than a lot of teams had that week, and numbers that were better than any Steelers running back would have until the 21st century, what John Fuqua did in the season finale of the 1970 season was nothing short of remarkable.